Mark chapter number 10, we see a guy by the name of Bartimaeus who is blind and he is begging. And uh, we see that in this moment, we, there's people around who think that because of him being blind, that he's done something bad. They think that his family's done something bad or he's done something bad because in this time period, they would think if you were blind or if you couldn't walk or if you had any kind of health issues, if you were going through something, that it was your fault that God was punishing you for this. And so Bartimaeus is going through this moment. So not only does he have to deal with the blindness, but he has to deal with the shame of people judging him for the blindness. And I don't know if you've ever had a time in your life where you looked to people for help not only did they not help you, but they made you feel bad for needing help in the first place. And so that's where Bartimaeus is, and he's sitting there, and he's going through this moment, and, and, and he's facing this blindness. And it says in uh, Mark 10, 46, then they came to Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man named Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus asks for mercy before he asks for anything else, which kind of leads me to believe that he had started to expect the same thing everybody else expected, that because of his situation, it was due to him or his family doing something wrong. He asked for mercy before he ever asked to be healed. And he cries out, he says, God, if you will show me mercy in my situation. And it says in verse 48, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Kind of makes me think of my kids, right? Like when they're shouting and screaming at each other, it's like, hey, stop. But I have to shout to do it. So then everybody else, they keep shouting louder. But, but he, he, he's saying, God, I want mercy. And then they yell at him, to be quiet in this moment. Have you ever gotten to a point though where you needed Jesus so bad, you were so desperate that you did not even care what anybody else said? Right, like when they tried to silence you or they tried to tell you it was impossible or they tried to tell you to give up on it or to stop believing for it, you didn't care. That's where Bartimaeus is. They tell him to be quiet and Bartimaeus is like, no, like this isn't your situation, this is mine, help! He keeps crying out, even though they're telling him to be quiet. Verse 49, Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. And the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Now, obviously, Jesus knew what he wanted. This is Jesus, right? He knows all things. And, and Bartimaeus is blind, so it's probably easy to guess what he's coming to you for. But Jesus wanted him to acknowledge the need because one of the greatest things holding many of us back is our unwillingness to acknowledge that we have a need in the first place. And one of the greatest things that stops us from seeing God move in our lives is our unwillingness to acknowledge that we need him to move in the first place. So when Bartimaeus shows up asking Jesus for help, Jesus is like, cool, I'll help you, but time out. What exactly do you want help with? I need to hear, like I need you to acknowledge that there is something that you cannot do on your own. There is something that you cannot conquer on your own. You cannot overcome on your own. Verse 52, go, Jesus said. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. I love that Jesus said, your faith has healed you. Did not say your effort has healed you. He didn't say the fact that you were good enough that it's healed you. He did not say that your talent has healed you. He did not say that your good looks has healed you. He said, your faith has healed you. It was the faith that brought the healing. Nothing else but the faith. Nothing else but his faith in that moment. And what I know is that no matter where you're at in life today, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what your situation is right now, no matter what you walk through the doors going through today, we have all experienced moments of desperation. We've all experienced moments of desperation. We've, we've all had times in our lives where something was not functioning the way that we wanted it to. 
things were not going the way that we wanted it to. And, and that could be such a difficult moment. And that's where Bartimaeus is. He's, he's blind. He's going through this blindness. He's out there begging. And he hears that Jesus is there. Then he calls out and he's desperate. And we know that he's desperate because he calls out to God. He calls out. He says, Jesus, hello. And everybody's like, shh, be quiet. So what's he do? He shouts even louder because he was desperate in the moment. And he knew that Jesus was the answer. But he was surrounded by people who were trying to stop him. And this can be in these moments such a discouraging place to be, right, where you know that you need Jesus or you know you need something to change. You know you need some help. You look to people, they won't help you. You cry out for Jesus and then other people are there telling you that, well, he's not gonna help you until you get some things in order. He's not gonna show up for you until you do some things. You need to be quiet. You need to just sit down for a little while. You, you're not really at a place, like right? Like you gotta serve the Lord for 10 years before you can do anything great. What you asking him for help for? You, you owe him right now. It's such a difficult place to be where, where you know there's something and you're seeking help, but it can be discouraging to hear other people tell you to stop seeking the help. Stop asking for help, stop looking for help. And yet while these moments can be discouraging, they can also bring freedom because they allow us to see that our identity is not in what we are going through. Our identity is not in where we are and our identity is not in who is around us or who has left us, but our identity is in the truth that Jesus called us because he called for Bartimaeus after everybody else told him to be quiet. Our identity rests in the truth that Jesus called us and that is how we are able to cheer up and have joy in the midst of difficult moments. That is, a, that is how we were able to cheer up and have joy in the midst of frustrating moments because we're not identified by what we're going through. We're not identified by who has left us. We're not identified by what people have said, but we're identified by the fact that Jesus said, I love you, you're worth dying for, I've called you, I care for you. That is why we can have cheer. So I wanna talk to you this morning on the fourth week of running with the horses. If you're tired, if you've been feeling depleted, if you've been feeling worn down, if you've been feeling discouraged, I wanna talk to you on this subject, cheer up. Cheer up. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for today. I thank you that we have the opportunity to gather together today. Lord, I pray that in this moment you would help nobody to see me, nobody to hear from me, but that they would see and hear from you. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our lives specifically what we need to hear from you today. Lord, I thank you that I can say the same thing out loud, but everybody in this room and online can hear something completely different to hear what it is that you're saying to them. Lord, help us to have ears to hear from you today, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Now, how many of you, by a show of hands, how many of you would say that you know somebody in your life, friend, family member, who's a little bit extreme on like health conscious eating, right? Like they're healthy conscious on their eating, right? Like paleo and vegan and all natural, like all these things. And those things are great. Like those things are good and eating healthy is good. It's important. My wife and I, we really eat healthy at home because I'm married to her, right? On my own, I was eating like ramen noodles and you know, the microwavable dinners. We got married and she said, you are eating a vegetable in every single meal. So every time we have dinner at home, like we're eating healthy. But there are days where I just, I just want to have a, a bad day of eating. You know what I mean? Like you just kind of wake up and it's like one of those weeks and you just want to like, you just want to veg out. Like I'm just, I'm eating today, right? Like I, I've been working hard. I've been going through all this. I'm eating today. And there's those days that that happens. And, and all I ask is that if I want to eat a Krispy Kreme donut cheeseburger, five chocolate chip cookies and some ice cream, all I ask is that you let me eat it in peace. That's all, like, that's all I ask. Is that too much to ask? No, right? Like, I let you eat your leaf in peace, but let me eat my stuff in peace. I'm just, and the reason I'm so passionate about it is because about 10 years ago, I had gone to this business luncheon with this guy, did not really know him at all, and we're sitting down, we're eating, everything's going good, it's a wonderful meal, great. 
Great conversation during the appetizers. But then they come and they say, hey, we want to take your order. And so he's like, hey, you go ahead, go, you go first. I don't know this guy, right? So I'm like, okay, cool, I'm going to go first. And I'm paying for my food, so I'm going to eat what I want to eat. So I said, okay, I will take a bacon cheeseburger. This is 10 years ago, right? I was 23, could do this kind of thing. So I'm like, I'll take a bacon cheeseburger. I don't want lettuce. I don't want tomato. And I want crispy French fries. And I want a cookies and cream milkshake. And this guy, and I'm not exaggerating, he just looks at me with dis like, like disgust. So I was like, I was like, oh man, like, are you okay? Everything good? He ignores me. And then he says, I will take the kale salad <laughs> with no dressing. I'm like, hey, bold choice, you know? Cool though. Hey, hey, hey. We're living. You're paying for your meal, I'm paying for mine. This ain't one of those business luncheons. You got your own thing, you do it. So I look at him, and, and he looks at me again. Like he orders and then gives me a look. So again, I said, hey, man, everything good? Like you good? And he said, trying to bulk up? <laughs> I don't know you. Who are you talking to? So you're trying to bulk up? And see, this is the thing, like there's Dustin in my head and then there's Dustin what I say, right? Like, so in my head, what I wanted to say, okay, Peter Rabbit, like, you know, eating a kale salad with no dressing, right? Like I'm not sitting here saying anything to you. Like that's not even a salad. That is, that is grass. Like you are eating a leaf like this at this point. There's no dressing. But, what I, but instead, instead, I just kind of looked at him, you know, and he said, well, you know, I just, I don't understand how people eat like that. Because God only gave us one body. Like, dude brought God into it. <laughs> you know, he knows I'm in ministry. So, I mean, what am I going to? And I wish, like, that I could tell you that I stood firm, stood strong, but I was still in, like, people-pleasing mode. So I was like, okay, you know what? I stopped the waiter, and I said, hey, like, I don't want the cheeseburger. Forget about the cheeseburger. I'll take a kale salad, too. But I do want the dressing. You know, like, give me some ranch. Like, douse it in ranch. I don't even want to, you know. And here's the deal, I had never had kale before. Furthermore, I have never had kale since. Because he places this thing in front of me, and I try to eat it, y'all, and, and I was just like, I, I can't. And so that's kind of the icing on the cake, right? Because I was sitting there looking at a salad I was not going to eat, and I realized eating healthy is expensive because the salad was $15. My burger was nine. <laughs> so instead of enjoying this perfectly good burger for nine bucks, I've wasted $15. And in that moment, I was like, you know what? I'm never going to let somebody push me around again. I'm going to eat what I want to eat in the moment. Because I eat good on the most part, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this sometimes. But I've thought about this day multiple times ever since. Like it's just kind of replayed in my mind randomly sometimes when I'm getting a Krispy Kreme donut cheeseburger or something. I'll think about this moment and how I would have played it differently now that I'm older Right, And one of the ways I would have done is when he said, I just don't understand how people eat like that, I would have told him, well, that's cool. You don't have to understand because it's not for you. It's for me. So you ain't got to understand how I'm eating this wonderful bacon cheeseburger and the cookies and cream milkshake because it's not for you in the first place. Now, that was just a burger. But I can't help but wonder how many times in our lives we have missed out on the good things God had for our lives because we've been so worried about the opinions of everybody else. I can't help but wonder how many times we've stopped short of what God wanted to do in our lives because we were so worried about what everyone else had to say. Bartimaeus was blind. He cries out, and they tell him to be quiet. What if he would have listened? Because everybody else had an opinion about his situation. But let me tell you a secret. When it comes to people trying to tell you that they don't understand, when it comes to trying to make people understand how it is that you're doing what you're doing in your life, how it is that you're believing for what you're believing in your life, and they're like, I don't understand you. I don't get you. Here's a secret, and this is the first thing I want you to write down, type in the chat, whatever it is. They don't have to understand. They don't have to understand. You do not have to help 
somebody understand something that is not even for them. You don't have to help them understand something that does not even affect them. It said in verse number 49, verse 48, it says, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Stop allowing people to talk you out of something that is not even for them in the first place. Stop allowing people to hold you back, to change your opinion, and stop allowing their opinions to rob you of something that is not for them in the first place. Bartimaeus was not bothering anybody. He just wanted the same thing that everybody else wanted. He wanted an experience with Jesus. Bartimaeus is there. Everybody's there. Everybody's trying to get to Jesus. But they looked down on Bartimaeus because of his situation. And they felt like they were more deserving of Jesus than he was because of where they were compared to where he was. But the beautiful thing is Jesus said, all y'all be quiet. What do you need? But if Bartimaeus would have allowed them to silence his cry, then he might never have seen what Jesus wanted to do for him that day in the first place. He wanted the same thing everybody else wanted. He wanted an experience with Jesus. But he was surrounded by people who were trying to tell him to be quiet. And it had to be discouraging, right? To be believing for something, but to be surrounded by people who are not supportive. You ever been around family? I mean, people like that, that it's like you're believing for something, but they're not supportive or colleagues or, or, or friends or a relationship that you're believing for something. But when they look at you, they're like, you're crazy to believe for that. How could you ever think God could do that for you? How could you ever think you are worthy for God to do that? But when people come against your shout, when people come against your cry for help, when people come against your faith and your hope, do not be discouraged. It's not for them anyways. It doesn't matter what they say. And let me just say this. Be mindful of who you hang with. You gotta be mindful of who you hang around with because you gotta watch out for people who do not wanna see you go any greater than where you're at right now. You have people in your life, I promise you, we all have people in our lives that they're good being our friend as long as we stay at the level we're at. They're good hanging out with us so long as we're still where we're at because there are people in our lives that are addicted to our need for them. And they're addicted to, be able to being able to look at us and pity where we're at. And the moment that we start talking about leveling up, that's when they gotta check out. And in your life, you got three types of people always. You have doubters, suppressors, and cheerleaders. Doubters, suppressors, and cheerleaders. I'd write that down because you're going to want to categorize some people. Doubters, suppressors, and cheerleaders. Your doubters, real quick, your doubters are the ones who do not believe that Jesus can do something in your life because it's too dysfunctional. You are too messed up. You are too far gone. You cannot see God do it. Doubters are the ones who do not believe God can do something for you because they've never seen God do something for them. And the reason they've never seen God do something for them is because they never believed God could do it. So you have the doubters in your life that'll tell you it can never happen. God can't do it. I can't believe you're believing for that. You haven't earned it. You don't deserve it. You'll never see it. You have doubters. Then you have suppressors. And the suppressors are the ones who, they're, they're the ones that they have no initiative, so they don't want you to have initiative either. Suppressors are the ones, they're not willing to cry out to Jesus so they don't want you to cry out to Jesus. Suppressors are the ones who think that God is limited. So they feel like if you get what you're believing for, they'll never be able to see what they're believing for. If you walk in your calling, then they'll never be able to walk in their calling because they think God is limited. And suppressors are a lot more difficult to identify because they actually may want you to do good. You may have suppressors in your life that they're pulling for you and they're there for you and they're in your corner until you get to the point that you're about to pass where they're at. See, suppressors 
are difficult to identify because they look like a friend until you start going to another level that they can't go to. And then they start saying, well, you know, I mean, I don't know, like, I've known you. We've been through a lot together. I know your story. I know everything you've been through. Are you sure that God really said this? That's your suppressors. And then you have your cheerleaders, and that's who you want to hang out with, cheerleaders. We talked about a few weeks ago, you got to get you some hype people in your life. Get you a hype man. My wife and I were watching this show called Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Like, I mean, it's not a new show. We're, we're binge-watching an old show. And there's this guy, Jake Peralta is the main guy. Then he's got Charles Boyle who's his like best friend. And no matter what Jake does, Charles Boyle acts like it's the best thing in the world. Like he's his cheerleader. You need cheerleaders in your life. You need people that are in your corner. Cheerleaders are the ones who have actually had an experience with Jesus. And the way you know that they've actually had an experience with Jesus is because they want everybody else to experience the same thing that they've experienced. They're not trying to stop people. They're not trying to, they've truly experienced the goodness of Jesus. So they want every single person they know, they're pulling for them to see the fullness of all that God has for them. Cheerleaders are the ones who are actually close to Jesus because Bartimaeus is there, he's blind, he's begging, he's crying out to Jesus and everybody around him tells him to be quiet. But as Jesus gets closer, the people who are around Jesus become a cheerleader for Bartimaeus. I'll show it to you real quick. In verse 49, it said, Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. So Bartimaeus had people around him telling him to be quiet, telling him to shut up, telling him to quit believing. But as Jesus approached, there's some people there that are close to Jesus, and Jesus says, I want you to call that man. And they come over and they're like, hey, get up, man. Cheer up. Let's go. It's your time. It's your moment. And they cheered him on in that moment. Because in your life, when you have a cheerleader, they are so pumped. They're more pumped when you see something than when they do. Because they know, hey, if God could do it for them, God's going to do it for me. If God can show up for them, God's gonna show up for me. And when I see the fulfillment of what God said, I want people around me cheering too. I'm not trying to hold you down. I'm not trying to hold you back, but I want you to experience the fullness of all that God said because I know that he can do it. It does not matter what people say to you. It does not matter how people treat you. It does not matter how people handle you. All that matters is that Jesus called you. And that's the next thing I want you to see is Jesus called you. It doesn't matter about the people that told Bartimaeus to be quiet. It doesn't matter about the people that told him to shut up, to sit down, to stay there. Hey, get used to it. You've always been there. You're always going to be there. None of that mattered. All that mattered and all that changed in the moment was when Jesus called him. Said Jesus stopped and said, call him. It wasn't the people's decision to call him. It was Jesus's decision to call him. It was Jesus's decision to call Bartimaeus. Do not put your identity in what anybody else says about you. Do not put your identity in who leaves your life. Do not put your identity in who is surrounding you. Put your identity in the fact that Jesus called you. Somebody say, I'm called. Jesus called you, and that is all that matters. When we start thinking and and becoming obsessed and focused on what other people say about us, we lose sight of what God says. When we become so consumed with the thing that somebody said to us or the label that they gave us or the name that they called us or the fact that they said we weren't worth staying with, and they said they could find something better, when we put our identity in that, when we put our focus in that, it causes us to lose sight of what God says about us. And I believe somebody here needs to know today that in spite of what's been done to you, in spite of what's been said to you, in spite of the people who have left your life, who's abandoned you, or who's around you right now, Jesus has called you. Jesus called you. Your family didn't call you. Your coworkers didn't call you. Your past relationship didn't call you. Jesus called you, Jesus equipped you, and Jesus will empower you. But the thing, the thing that I love most about this story 
is that when Jesus calls him, he calls him right in front of all the people that told him to be quiet. He, he called him right in front of all the people that rebuked him and told him that he did not deserve for Jesus to heal him. He did not deserve for Jesus to show up in his life. That's where Jesus called him, in front of all of those people, because they didn't understand that Jesus does not call you because you deserve it. He doesn't show favor to the ones who deserve it. Jesus shows favor to the ones who pursue it. It was the pursuit of Bartimaeus that caught Jesus' attention. It was his willingness to say, I don't care what you say, I don't care what you do to me, but I'm going to push through because I have to get to him. It wasn't that he deserved it. It wasn't that he had gone to church every single Sunday in 2022. It was the fact that he pursued. If you come to church and just sit, but you're not pursuing him, then you're gonna stay where you've always been. The difference in people who read the Bible or who pray or who, who go to church, who don't see Jesus do things, and the ones who do, is the pursuit. Because there are so many people who are just living the religious life where I'm checking the box that I've done this and I've done that and I did this. Now I know God's going to do it. And so many of these people around Bartimaeus, I have to believe, they thought that because they were doing these things that they deserved it more than him. And Jesus said, no, it's not about what you've done. It's not about you deserving it. It's about the pursuit. The fact that Bartimaeus was willing to acknowledge that without me, he was gonna stay right where he was at. While some of us begin to think that we can do it on our own. God, I'm believing for this, but if you don't, I got a backup plan. But Barnabas was in a moment where he didn't have a backup plan. He had tried everything. He had exhausted every resource. And he said, Jesus, if you don't do it, it ain't gonna happen. If you don't show up, it's not gonna happen. See, you don't have to impress him to earn his favor. You, you don't have to impress him to gain his favor. We often think that we have to, to, to clean ourselves up to draw close to Jesus, right? We tell people, it's like, oh, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta do this, you gotta look a certain way, you gotta do all these things in order to draw close to Jesus. Jesus said, no, like we sang earlier, it's not about how we have to be to draw close to him, it's about that he loves us too much to leave us where we're at. So once we draw close to him in all of our filth, in all of our mess, in all of our circumstance, once we draw close, then he brings the change. But so often we think that we have to clean ourselves up in order to draw close to him. Religion says that, that his love, that his care, that his concern for you can only happen if you prove yourself worthy, if you prove that you deserve it. But Jesus saw the best in people when they were at their worst. Jesus saw the best in people when they were at their worst. When the woman with the issue of blood came at her worst moment, Jesus saw the best in her, brought healing. When Mary came before him after adultery, thrown before him, he didn't see what she had done. He saw the best and brought healing spiritually, supernaturally, emotionally to her life because Jesus saw the best in people when they were at their worst. He met them in their realities. He met them in their mess. He met them in their most difficult moments, in their most desperate moments. He met Bartimaeus not in the kingdom. He didn't meet Bartimaeus like out just chilling. He met Bartimaeus in a moment where everybody was looking down on him. Everybody had discounted him. Everybody had told him that he didn't deserve to even cry out. Not only did they not think that he was worthy of being healed, they didn't even think he was worthy of calling on Jesus' name. And Jesus met him in that moment. And then watch what Bartimaeus does. I love this verse 50. It says, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. The cloak he was wearing was called a beggar's cloak, right? And this is a cloak that people wore when they were begging. Begging was actually an occupation that you could have in this moment. So he's wearing this beggar's cloak. Everybody that sees him knows by the cloak that he has on what he does. They know who he is. 
even if you read the text real carefully, because I encourage you to read the text throughout the week, if you read it real carefully as you read along, it starts calling him the blind man. Doesn't even call him Bartimaeus. Calls him by his label, the blind man. So wearing this beggar's cloak, let everybody know that he's begging, that he's got circumstances. When they see him, they know exactly what he's going through. So he threw the cloak away. This is huge. He threw the cloak away. The next thing I want you to write down, last thing I want you to see is you got to change the label. You got to change the label. He threw the cloak, watch, before he was ever even healed. He threw the cloak before he ever saw what he was believing for. He was not healed yet, but by faith, he threw the cloak aside because he said, I know that I've got to remove the label that ties me to my past condition. And so many of us, we're seeking healing, but we're still tying ourselves to our past condition. Well, I've always been a womanizer, or I've always had problems with money, or I've always had problems being faithful. And we're tying ourselves to our past condition. I've always ended up heartbroken in relationships. I've always ended up getting fired. I've always failed when I started my business. I've always, I've always failed the Lord anytime I try to start growing in my relationship with him. And we're tying ourselves to our past condition. And Jesus shows up and he's like, listen, I want you to throw it away because what I'm about to do is gonna change all of that. But if you keep holding on to that, then you're not going to see what I'm going to do. Bartimaeus threw the cloak away before he ever saw it. Tell somebody, you gotta remove the label. Remove the label. Stop labeling who you are and start labeling who you're becoming. Stop labeling who you are and start labeling who God said you're going to be. I may be sick, but I am healed. I may be finished, but I am just getting started. I, I may be lost, but I'm gonna be found. I may be down, but I am getting back up because I'm not staying where I'm at. I have been called and I am being changed. I'm being changed. And so Jesus, after Bartimaeus removes the label, Jesus says in verse 52, last verse I'm gonna read, go, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Now I wanna look real quick at the order of events here says, go, your faith has healed you. All right, Jesus told him to go before he said he was healed. Go, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight after Jesus told him to go and followed Jesus along the road. Jesus told him to go before he was even healed. And the way so many of us live our lives and the way that I've lived my life before that it's a constant daily battle to say, God, help me to live through the miracle, not waiting for the miracle. Because Jesus told him to go before he was healed. And the way many of us live is we say, God, I will serve you after you do this. God, I will believe after you do this. God, I will have faith after you you do this. God, I will serve you all the days of my life if you will get my family saved. God, I will serve you all the days of my life if you will bring somebody in my life for me to marry. God, I will serve you all the days of my life if you will help my health issues to go away. God, I will serve you all the days of my life if you help my spouse to get right. You help my kids to get right. God, I will serve you if. Jesus said, no, 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 no. I want you to go and then see the healing. I want you to go and then see the miracle. He's not waiting on you to have it all figured out. He's not waiting on you to have it all together, but you do have to be willing to go. You have to be willing to go to say, God, I praise you in the midst of this storm. I praise you in the midst of this battle. I will tell people of your goodness in the midst 
of the opposition. I will tell people about how amazing you are, even though I feel like I'm in the darkest valley that I've ever been in. I will tell people that you are a deliverer, even though I still feel like I'm in a difficult moment. I will tell people that you are a provider, even when I feel like I don't know how I'm gonna make it this month. I will speak of your goodness. I will walk alongside of you. I will go with you because God, I'm not serving you because of what you do for me, but I'm serving you because of who you are. You have to be willing to go, even if you got to start blind. God, I don't see a way out of this. I don't see it getting better. I don't see the diagnosis changing. Been to the doctor four times, like, hey, I know you got it wrong because I got faith. No, it's still the same. Next day, oh, I know you got it wrong. God, I still have faith. Same diagnosis. God, I'm going to go blind. I don't see it yet, but I'm going to go blind. I'm going to go even when I don't have it all figured out. You got to go because here's the thing. Jesus called you. Jesus called you. And if he called you, you know that he will fulfill what he said. In spite of where you're at, in spite of where you've been, in spite of who's around you, in spite of what you've been going through, Jesus called you. And that's how we're able to cheer up. Tell somebody next to you, tell them, cheer up. Cheer up. That's how we're able to cheer up. That's how we're able to have joy. Not because I see everything changing, but because I know that Jesus called me and I know that he is faithful and I know that he will do it. And I know that even though it may not have happened right now, it may not happen tomorrow, it may not happen next week, it might not even happen in 2022. I know that Jesus called me and if he called me, he's gonna do it. So I have a reason to cheer up. I have a reason to have joy. I have a reason to have hope. I have a reason to believe. I have a reason to know that it's not always going to be this way. And even though I may be tired right now, even though I may feel depleted right now, I may have more questions than answers right now, I'm happy. I'm cheerful because I know that I've been called by the only one who can truly change my life.